Hello and welcome along to another episode of our Football Stadium Review Series, Review the 92. We're moving through the seas and this week we're on to another club and this is probably going to be a bit of a mixed bag. But before we go and get into that with my co-host Tom as usual, if you are looking forward to this one, please put a thumbs up on it. If you have missed any of the series so far, you can catch up with all of the other A to C's in the eye above, including Cardiff last week, which was a bit of a positive one. In fact, we've had two in a row with Carlisle as well, but this week, probably a little more mixed. So we are going to be mm. talking about Charlton Athletic and ranking it in its key areas. But as always, before we do that, let me give you some of the key stats. A capacity at the Valley of 27,111, opened in 1919 and renovated in the early 90s. So taking a, a similar path to most of the old grounds we've had so far. The record capacity and I don't know how, based on the size of the ground, even when it was standing, is 75,031, which was in 1938 for an FA Cup tie. But obviously the all-seater attendance has been a sellout multiple times in the Premier League years. So we went in 2019 on the way to Luton's title charge in League One last season. Wasn't the best day for the club. It wasn't a great result. And it was a bit of a bizarre day. So talk to me, Tom, about your initial thoughts of the Valley and the experience itself. So, yeah, as you said, it was towards the end of the season, wasn't it? Was it April that we went? I think it was April. <coughs> Let me just double check. I've got it up. Uh, yes, 13th of April. There we go. So everything's quite straightforward, isn't it? From um, travelling, obviously, Luton to London. It's one it's of direct, them. wasn't it? I don't think we did the direct no. ones, but they did lay on extra trains that did go straight from Luton to Charlton. Because we went for lunch with your family. Do I remember rightly there? Yeah, we met up with my family. So they had a day out in London. They mm -hmm. went around Greenwich and we, we left them, didn't we? We carried on to the ground. So yeah, we had a nice day. Easy to get to for us. A relatively local away day. But after you <laughs> the public transport and you get in the ground, that's when things become a bit more tricky. Less organised, yes. should we say. Yes, I guess less organised is the perfect term. I mean, we'll move on to the key areas in a minute, but I guess I, I was more torn by this ground than I have been any other so far because the ground itself, once you get into your seat and you've got the four stand, it's a fantastic stadium. It's got a lot of the features that we like. It's still, despite being renovated in the 90s, got a few of the old school features which are quite nice and the things that we look for. It's got some of the corners that aren't filled in, which we've talked about multiple times being a positive. But... As you say, if you take one step out of your seat and into a foyer or to try and leave the ground, you then incur some problems. Um, are, are there any notable ones for you before I go on my various rants about outside the ground? No, it's the outside bit that really does stick in the mind, doesn't it? And especially like when, or you, I think I'll leave it to you to talk about how you when you were trying to buy some snacks or a drink before the game and how how uh, difficult that proved to be. Yes. So, I mean, I guess that's what I would say about the away end. And it probably, and it's the reason I had to factor in, it's probably not the case for most of the ground. But the entrance to the away end, there was only one route in to the left of the stand, which being quite an old school one, it's fine. And then there was a hill to get to the other side. But the entrance is where they had the two refreshment porter cabins. So the people were queuing sort of sideways back here. But they were then blocking the gap between the entrance to the ground and the entrance to the stand here. And they were just queuing across it, which made it almost impossible to enter. And obviously the, the organisation was nowhere to be seen. There were two or three poor like teenagers working behind the refreshments cabin. So, I mean, I've never seen people working so hard in my life before a football match or at a football ground. And to be fair, the prices were reasonable for London and everything else was fine. But... It just seemed like it could have been organised in a more sensible way, probably is the fair way to say it. Yeah. Just encourage, yeah, large like congregations and people mm. like getting in the way. And and it wasn't a space that could handle large congregations. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And there, obviously it was towards the end of the season, Luton were doing really well. And as we said, it's not far from them to travel. So as expected, there was a good away following. Yeah. And it just seemed like, even though it's a big ground, it's not like a... Like a yeah. It's tiny one that's thinking, oh, it probably can't handle this this level of away support. Obviously can. It's been in the Premier League. As we were kids, Charlton were always, were always an established Premier League club when we were growing that, up. But... That entrance is for half of a 3,000 stand, you know. That's 1,500 people you're expecting to go through there. It's not. It's not that's really it. set up for that. And I know there are lots of places that aren't, but it just it didn't seem like it could cope that way. 
ideally they would probably be in on the other side of this land another entrance wouldn't there so you'd have half you'd have it would be split not well, every single fan coming in the same entrance i think if we're being fair probably for premier league games and things like that it would be but i don't know if you remember because there wasn't too much of a home attendance or not as much as a full capacity because of the ownership problems and that at the time the the other end of the stand wasn't open because the home fans weren't sitting at that end of the stand so we were all sort of crammed in two thirds away across but we were only going through the one entrance or the one and a half entrances at the time, which made it probably a bit harder than it would be normally. And I guess oh, that's right. to save on policing and whatever else, which we'll come to later. But that sort of is a slight mitigating circumstance for me. But again, didn't help our experience on that day. I didn't realise that. OK, so yeah, that makes it a bit easier to understand. But yeah, at the time, it just felt like this This is not what we you'd expect you'd ex- from, a, from a ground as yeah, as good as it is in a club that have had a history in the Premier League, you'd expect a, a, just a better standard, really, of entering and exiting a stadium. So I guess we'll talk about a bit more, to, a redeeming feature of getting inside the actual ground, and then we'll start to move on to the key areas, starting with atmosphere, because inside the ground, obviously there was a lot of buzz about the game. Luton were top of the league, 28 matches unbeaten in the league. Mick Harford was back in charge after Nathan Jones went off to Stoke and had kept us unbeaten for another two and a half months with some amazing results along the way. Charlton were flying up the league with Lee Bowyer despite the ownership and off-the-pitch problems and eventually obviously took them up the last kick of the game against Sunderland in the playoff final. And you could tell immediately it was two very good sides. Charlton, I would argue away, that is probably the toughest game we've had in the whole year. Yeah, it kind of got quite, um, I wouldn't say complacent, but ex- it obviously became quite rare you'd see Luton lose. Well, the and fans that- sort of assumed a victory, didn't they? Going in, it was full of confidence, not really realising quite how good Charlton were. And again, obviously, we've talked about this coming off of two back-to-back promotions. So a lot of Luton fans had almost been spoiled, hadn't they, for a couple of years. They'd grown accustomed to being yeah. the, the favourites in every game. So they turned off at Charlton. I guess, yeah, quite jubilant. And, yeah, Charlton made quite light, let's be honest, light work of beating Luton. They had some real, they had some real good players, didn't they? That, is it Lyle Taylor? Yeah, and yeah. Their players in the team think, and fast forward a year and they, they look like they, had a, they were going to stay up, possibly they had a better chance than Luton did of staying up. Yeah. And was it Barnsley, the third team? Yeah. They were doing the best out of the three clubs, even though they were the playoff winners, weren't they? So, yeah, Charlton had a, had a strong team and, quite convincingly beat Luton on the day, if we're being honest. Yeah, I mean, Luton had uh, a red card. There were penalty shouts. I think that I vaguely remember a moment of absolute chaos from James Shea. I can't remember exactly what it was. I just have a vague memory of it. Um, Andrew Shinney got sent off. He was one of our best players last season. Uh, it was just a, a bit of a weird day. They almost bullied us, to be honest. Lyle Taylor, in particular, up top, just completely ran the show. And we won't go too much into this year because obviously Charlton look like if the leagues do get voided or points per game, they will probably be one of the biggest losers in the Football League, having fallen into the relegation zone the week before the lockdown for the first ever time. It That's seems a little bit harsh on them. And the same for devastating, yeah. I mean, there's there's some examples of that everywhere. Tranmere in League One who are three points behind with a game in hand and things like that. You just you start to think we're looting. It's probably a bit more clear cut, isn't it? But we'll get back to that. But in terms of the game itself, the atmosphere was quite good for me, even though it wasn't full. It was about sixteen thousand. Uh, Charlton have been averaging a bit less than that that season, but it was a great atmosphere. They were behind their team. Um, it was it was very different once the game started. It was quite empty until then, as you'd expect with the owners' problems and things like that. But once the game got started, they were behind the team. They were loud. They were excited whenever their team were attacking. And their team were playing well, which obviously contributed to that. Yeah. I think I remember the stand directly opposite us behind the other goal being, yeah. being loud and in good voice. So, yeah, I second that. I think it was a decent atmosphere. It's another one of those, to be honest, that I just, I'd quite like to go, I, I mean, in terms of the entrance, I wouldn't like to go back and the policing, but I'd like to go back when it's full to see what it's like when it's rocking, because it was a pretty good atmosphere, half full. I can imagine what it'd be like when Charlton are flying and in the Premier League. So for me, based on the events and understanding that some fans wouldn't be there because of the ownership problems, I'm happy to give the atmosphere a solid eight out of 10. I'll go seven. But what I will say on that is, it's always impressive. I, I do feel like when 
when it's a city, it's got a few teams. Oh. And obviously London's got the most in the country. And it would be so easy to support another club very nearby and one of the bigger teams that I do I do feel like fans of these clubs deserve like an extra bit of yeah. respect in a way. You know what I mean? To have a very passionate support when it would be easier probably to support one of the big clubs up the, up the road. Absolutely. So, yeah, they're well supported and good club and yeah, going just going back to what you said in the introduction, I, the, the Valley 75,000 did you say? Yeah. That's mad. I do remember my granddad saying I think the Valley held the record for maybe the biggest attendance for a while and I guess he's, he's probably referring to that. That's that is incredible. It's, uh, to think that space, it's not the biggest ground in the world and I'd love to know how 75,000 people got about getting in the ground. I know it probably wasn't as closed off back then, but wow, that's, logistically, that must have been a nightmare. Yeah, because it's very built up, isn't it? It's residen- residential mm. around there. So, phew, that's great. I do like it when a football club's put a ground in a residential area. As we said about Cambridge, quite the opposite. I do like it when it's quite built up and seeing people yeah, walking along the streets before it. Absolutely. Moving on to location. This is probably the one of the four that I'm most torn on, because in terms of the location, there's a lot of things that you would consider good. It is a minute and a half from the train station or tube station, whatever. It was a train station, wasn't it? Train, um, I don't think, yeah. Um, that far. At the end of the road, getting out of the ground, there's lots of little corner shops and whatever else you could need. So there's a lot of positives in that regard. The location itself is very easy to get to, as you mentioned, particularly for us as Luton fans. It's just a hop on the train to London. However, it's where we have to unfortunately talk about probably policing and issues getting out. And the location does contribute to that because I think it's fair to say probably London clubs generally is where we've had the most issues with policing and instances that we obviously as old before our time try and avoid. Um, I'm speaking for myself there, of course. Uh, We were coming out of the ground after the game. For some reason, there's one road out of the ground for two stands and there was just a row of of police horses and cones in the middle of the road with the fans separated on either side. Now, what, what I didn't understand is at the top of that very short road that then ended, which meant that the two fans were just congregating anyway, which unfortunately then led to a massive brawl outside the train station entrance and meant that all the normal fans had to then go and find shops or walk towards the other direction to get out of the way of it but then we had the instance where trying to walk out of the way of the big brawl to help the police deal with the issue the other police officers were then blocking us off from going the other way and forcing us to walk back towards it and we're talking about 30 seconds 100 yards at most to walk back in towards the incident which is one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen I think in the end we ended up in a bloody Sainsbury's for five minutes to get away from it and it's just it was a lack of organization again as you said at the start which led to issues that were so avoidable and for people like us who were trying to start a trouble and actually help the police by getting as few people around an instant as possible it just seemed all a bit bizarre and all a bit unnecessary because the whole thing kicked off from a police horse getting riled by a noise or whatever of something that hadn't started or occurred yet and it led to the break in the congregation. And as soon as that happened, I mean, we were just having a chat with Charlton fans and it would have been fine. Yeah, but... I just want to, exactly, well said. And I just want to like continue on that point. We'd been walking up the street with a couple of older Charlton fans and saying, like, oh, good luck for the rest of the season. Yeah. Hopefully both will be seeing you in the championship. Everything's civil. And they said, to, they seem, I think they even said to us, like, I don't know why they do this. Every game, they divide this street. And it's like, it's almost like, We've said at the time, it's like encouraging you to feel yeah. like, oh, it's us and you then, is it? It's like dividing the two fans. And it's a bit, it almost like provokes the fans to feel like, yeah. well, if the police expect us to scrap, then we're going to we're gonna play up to it. You know what I mean? If they'd have just let us all flow out together and maybe picked out if there's troublemakers gone to get them. But yeah, it just felt so over over the top, poorly policed. You said like the horses get, you know, getting a, a bit carried away and one thing led to another. And then suddenly, yeah, what? really wasn't like there was no like real rivalry or bad blood in the game spilled out and one of the like probably the biggest brawl i've seen after a football match in my life in my life and we've, between us we've been to a lot of football matches yeah. and it's not like it's not a derby so no. it doesn't it doesn't really make sense not, and we've been um, to plenty of derbies between us as well so it, it was yeah it was weird it's just and then like you say we tried to do the right thing we want to stay clear of that way 
let's head towards the train station. And then there's a, there's a policeman on the bridge saying, no, you, you can't cross here. You've got to go round. We're like, but to go round, we've got to go via 20, 30, 40, however many men that are trying, <laughs> trying to fight. We've got to put, yeah, tr- in, pushing fans back into that just seemed, I don't know, this lack in common sense completely didn't make any sense whatsoever, did it? And it, it sounded a bit like, oh, a bit embarrassed, like babyish, but I I had a Luton scarf on, I thought, well, we're outnumbered here, and there's people are getting really <laughs> irate, people are getting angry, I, I feel like, I don't, I want to be, like, you're you're quite clever, aren't you, you're quite neutral yeah. in your colours, you never really wear orange or white at football match, but I had my scarf on, I thought, shit, I need to, I feel like I've got to cover my scarf up now. Yeah, I mean, you're right, we did end up in the Sainsbury's, didn't we, for a few minutes, yeah. as it cal- while it calmed down. It's a it's a bit of a bizarre one, and obviously it has to factor into location because it put us in a bit of a predicament that we didn't need to be in. But generally, there's the one side of it where it's the ground's very easy to get to. It's in a good location. It's in all of the places. It's got all the things around it we'd like to have. But that little bit just weighed it down. And as you say, and it's probably quite a strong view. I know it's easy to have it as a fan. To me, there's 20 to 50 idiots at every club. If you try and force them to play up to the crowds, they're more likely to do so. That's just my opinion, but it seems to have happened. Where we've been, and generally it has been up north, and there's been a more relaxed atmosphere, and they've sort of let the fans go together. You mentioned Blackburn was a brilliant example of it, and there was no trouble at all. So that would always be my way forward. But for location, I'm going to have to go average as a result. Yeah, I don't know if it's so much location or how it was organized and placed if and i know we haven't talked about qpr yet and there's a lot we'll say about that if they'd have kept Luton fans in the ground for another 20 minutes and let the charlton fans disperse and then we'd have left it probably would have been next to no trouble at all it makes much more sense doing that to me than having a street divided for yeah. five minutes if that and then at the top of the street there's like a junction and you're like now it's a free fall do what you do as you please kind of thing just just keep the weight. If you think there might be a bit of trouble, just keep the away fans in a bit longer. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, wanna, I didn't want to rank the location down for it, but it's the fact, as you say, the Charlton fans we were speaking to just said, this happens every week, and you have to bear that in mind. So yeah, I don't want to rank the ground down too much. So I will go average 6 out of 10 because everything else in the location is good, but it's been made worse than it needs to be due to certain lacks of common sense in decision-making. I'm going to lay the blame more with how it was placed rather than where the ground is situated. So I'll go seven. Fair enough. So I think that's evened us up overall, despite the fact that we've got quite different opinions there. Let's move on to value, which for me is another bog standard simple one. So we looked it up before 20 quid we paid and it was the same price, by the way, this year in the championship, despite it being a different league and a step up. So for me, that's solid. It's not quite as good as last week where we got spoiled with Cardiff City, but... For London, as well, to bear in mind, I think that's pretty impressive and I'm happy to give it a good mark for value. Yeah, that is a factor you should you should bring into it as well, isn't it? The fact it is a London club and yeah. obviously everything's more expensive. So, yeah, I think I'll give him seven every time. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna play it safe with another seven then. I'm going to be a bit more generous with this one. Again, bearing in mind, and one of the things I take into account as a greedy man is that it's probably... The only London and surrounding, I haven't been to all of them yet, so don't blame me if your club's cheap, but of the London and surrounding ones I've been to, it's been by far the most reasonable for refreshments and things like that as well. So as a result, I will lean up and give it an 8 out of 10 because 20 quid for League One and Championship, I can't complain. I can't complain. Yeah, I never buy refreshments at the ground, so I, I, don't, I can't factor that into my decision. You're completely reliant on me for them. Yeah, I never look at the, the five system. And then moving on to the final one is character. And as we mentioned, it's been heavily renovated, but it still had a lot of old school features. We got one of the corners that wasn't filled in. Even where there was a corner, it wasn't just classic bowl. There are indents and I don't know what the correct word is, but slight unique features about it. It wasn't just a classic modern bowl. Um, And obviously, as we mentioned, the entrances are a bit of a hindrance at times, but you certainly can't call it anything other than unique and old school. No, because it's got age on its side, doesn't it? Was it, was it 19, 19, 19, 19. Yeah. So even though it has been done up and they've done a, I think they've done a very good job of it. Yeah. It has, it's, it's still old and 
yeah, you can accuse it of being a. What did we say? We're, we're going to start calling them modern bowls, didn't we? Not I was very bowls. careful that time. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's not you. Yeah. It's not a modern bowl. No, it's, I did like it. I did like the valley. And as I said, wouldn't mind going back there one day. Quite a, Apart from the result and what happened after the game, it was a good experience. So I'll, I'll be more generous. I've been given sevens. I'll give an eight this time. I actually agree with you on that. What I would say in terms of going back, I reckon if we were going as neutral fans and we were sitting in the home end, I think our experience in terms of the negative factors would have probably been far better if we'd have been on the opposite side of the grounds, if we hadn't have come out into that little street, if we'd had the home style entrances, I think we probably would have been rating this ground very highly. Once we got to our seat, there is not much I could fault in that ground. I thought it was a fantastic stadium. I really enjoyed it, even though we lost. And obviously, both teams ended up getting promoted again. So there were certainly no negatives to be drawn from it. So mm-hmm. I will give it an eight. I was I was on the verge of giving it a nine. But based on the scores I've given the others, I think that'd be a little bit too generous. But I think yeah. the thing to say is, apart from the logistics, we really like the Valley. It's just some of the issues that are probably outside the stadium's control itself are what have led to a little bit of its downfall for us. Yeah, it's not necessarily the stadium as such, but... Yeah, surrounding. I just on that point, you did mention it a couple of times when we've been to the London clubs. It's happened. What what do you put that down to? Why do you think it is London in particular? Because you said in the northern clubs, there's no we never we never really see any issues whatsoever. I guess Luton is fairly local to London, so that has its own reputation with it. Although it's not really derbies, as you mentioned. Um, and I guess treading a thinner line, you probably have to be careful with various other incidents and worries that police have in London and the the nature of things that go with that. I can understand to an extent why they're a bit more cautious and heavy handed, perhaps. But in terms of football fans, I felt like some of those issues can be avoided by just taking that step back and having that little bit more common sense, which... The Northern clubs, maybe you could say like a Carlisle, for example, where they can afford to do that. Not much goes on in Carlisle, but is that mm-hmm. really an excuse then for treating people differently in the south of the country? I don't know. I was just going to say again, yeah, you're right, because it's only, it's only half an hour on a train. Does that mean more fans come along? But we've been to Hillsborough and Stadium Alight and there's been four 4,000 plus Luton yeah. fans and not, not really seen many issues. And then, yeah, is it because... Diluting fans feel, oh, we're going into London. We've got to like put on a show, live up, live up to a reputation. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a, very easy to just blame the authorities, which I don't think it's a hundred percent in their court. But I, know, just, I do feel like it would be dealt with better. Just don't know if it's like, a, is it like a day out in the capital? Just I don't know. I'll, I'll be interest, intrigued to see if and when we ever get to football again, and we do another London club with loot, and if it if it have if it keeps happening, because I think. We've done Charlton and QPR, and I don't want to talk too much about QPR as we've got. We'll do an episode on them in turn. But is that the, are they the only two? I think so at the moment. Yeah, so but we went to yeah. together. We'll see if it continues at the if and when. Like I said, we'll get to an, another one. Absolutely. I guess overall the Valley, a good stadium, a few little down points, but most of them aren't the ground itself, which is actually really a fantastic stadium. So hopefully you won't be too scathing of our odd criticisms. If you did enjoy this episode, please put a thumbs up on it. If you're a Charlton fan, let us know what the home end's like. Is it a completely different way of getting in? Because that was our biggest problem Mm. with the ground. And let us know what you think of obviously the situation getting out too, if you've seen it different most weeks. Is it just because it was a southern local-ish team in town? Oh, there are fights every week. <laughs> it's basically what you're asking. <laughs> if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel for daily FM20 content and then this series continuing every Sunday at 4.30. Thank you as always to Tom for joining me. Cheers. And hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>